We're back at the coverage desk, and we've got some special guests, uh, Heather Cole and Maria Chin from Forrester, Serious Decisions Division of Forrester. Would that be a good way to put it? Close enough. Close enough. And so they just got done with an awesome responsibility. They had to deliver the first keynote of the conference, and it was about the state of sales enablement, and they had to say it in front of a whole room full of enablement professionals. So first of all, congratulations on handling the stress of, of all of that. Thank you. Next, what did you talk about? What, what did you try to get across about the state of where enablement is? So it was a little bit of a surprise because when we did the presentation, we put sales in parentheses. And that's because the trends that we're seeing over a few years now and what we're seeing coming in the future, is really based around how buyer behaviors are driving the way we need to enable the folks that are having interactions with those people. So in actuality, yes, it's about sales, but it's really about everybody who's interacting with the customer and the buyer across the entire revenue engine. So very buyer-centric. Yes. Absolutely. With the buying process becoming much more complex, it's giving us an opportunity to not only up our game around <coughs> sales enablement, meaning enablement of all those customer-facing roles, but also I was there to participate for the first time around including the indirect channel because it is such a significant amount of revenue and go-to-market strategy for many, many, many organizations that we can't go and think about it as an afterthought. We have to include partner enablement as the new sales enablement or... The new black. The yes. new black. <laughs> Which y'all both wore black, I noticed. Yeah, That's the, see how they did that? The fashionable Chanel mm -hmm. channel. So you guys, uh, your company is, is heavily into research. That's, that's what you guys hang your hat on. What did you cite to support the stuff you were talking about? Well, we cited a lot of data, but our job is really to have that data not just hang out there as a soundbite, but have it be meaningful and make sense. So the two places that we looked for that was really looking at um, our command center, which contains data, thousands and thousands of points of data from leaders from channel, from sales, from marketing that we gather over the years. And then it also, we looked at uh, what we do as the buyer study, and then we have a sales talent study where we actually ask reps, <laughs> how do you want to be enabled? And what's important to you? And what's keeping you from being successful? So all of those things come together to paint a picture of what enablement is really going through right now. And we started out the presentation talking about one of the kind of key indicators, it's almost like the canary in the coal mine. Luckily that canary's growing big and fat, and the canary is, <laughs> are you getting an increased budget for next year? Are you getting those extra dollars and those resources invested in your enablement program? And when we were looking at it, you know, many years ago, even when enablement was barely a thing, over a third of the organizations were getting investment and increased investment year over year. That was primarily due to, hey, you're doing a good job, keep doing more of the good job and enable those direct sales reps. And as the years have progressed, they continue to get more. So then it was 50% of the organizations are now getting increased investment. And then at, when we last checked it for next year, 76% of sales enablement organizations are getting a significant increase in their budget. Why? Not to do the same old thing, it's to enable more roles and more interactions across the revenue engine. So the reasons that they're getting that investment has changed. And the reason is buyers are interacting with many more roles and they're having many more interactions because those buying um, scenarios are much more complex. So we walk them through the storyline of what the buyer is going through and how that's driving more and more complex interactions and how if you are not enabling those critical interactions and the ones that the buyer thinks are most important and the people having them, then you're going to definitely lose out and you're going to be missing both. Yeah, the other piece of data that I found really interesting is we drew from our CMO study and we do a biannual CMO study and one of the trending or accelerating trends that we're seeing around that is the importance of enhancing partner and channel marketing capabilities specifically around partner enablement. And in fact, it was the number three driver of their marketing strategy which is very forward thinking over the next two years. And I love what you just said, it's not just about putting data out there to hang out there in a data point, but it's the perspective and the insight of what that's telling us. So when we ask a CMO about where and what's directing your priorities around your marketing strategy and partner enablement figures so prominently up from 
forth two years ago. That is a significant <laughs> indicator that not only are we increasing our investments, but we need to do it in the right way and combat the challenges that partners and sellers are having out there in the marketplace dealing with this more complex buying process. Now, one of the themes that I've talked about with a couple of people here is the C-suite and sales enablement now being on the radar of people in the C-suite. And so what it sounds like to me a little bit has happened is, all right, a CMO has said, holy cow, yeah, the buyer journey is changing. I got to wrap my head around this. To me, that plays right into the discipline of sales enablement because it's saying, oh, there's all this stuff happening. Who the heck is going to help me figure this out? Well, you guys have been on top of that for a long time. And it's interesting because two years ago we talked about how we're, we were seeing this pretty sudden transition to enablement organizations over about oh, 18 to 24 month period shifting to reporting to, a, to the CEO, not just a C-level, but the CEO. And that was where we thought our data might be wrong. You know, we went, oh, what, there, did we not ask the question right? Did we, is there a glitch in the Excel? And we went back and it absolutely was not because the C-suite is seeing enablement, whether it's partner or direct, as a strategic lever that's gonna get them to their goals, their business goals that they have at the C-level. Now, again, to caveat that, we don't necessarily see them reporting directly to the CEO. It's usually the office of the strategy, which is saying you're a huge piece of our strategy and our success in the coming years, so therefore you are going to be reporting into us, sometimes as an incubator situation, but sometimes permanently because it has that much influence and when done right, it is incredible what it can do to revenue goals, quota goals, et cetera. But when done wrong, it is a money pit. Yeah, and I would say from a partner enablement standpoint, this is absolutely true. Channel marketers who are responsible for developing the scalable, repeatable, consistent, um, best in class, right, uh, enablement model for the organization are getting a seat at the table, right? Because it's so strategic to the organization and they can l borrow from sales enablement, take direction from channel sales who's gonna look at maybe execute with those managed partners and those territory partners and really help articulate and architect what's needed, but they need somebody to programmatically put together because our partner ecosystems don't just exist with managed partners. It's a whole host of partner to partner collaboration of the masses where we're getting a significant amount of revenue and if we can enable them the right way then we're going to outperform our peers are you guys seeing this to be true across different firms firms of different sizes firms in different industries b2b and b2c stuff like that yeah so the size of the organization is an interesting one we look at size when in terms of enablement is the number of reps revenue has something to do with it but the truer litmus test is really saying how many reps do you have and somewhere around as low as the 25 rep mark, you can actually see enablement coming into play because of a couple of different things. They need to start not enabling on an individual basis in many cases. And if you're a high growth company, you, when you, if you get an influx of capital, it tends to happen when you're around that rep level. And suddenly you have to invest in different positions, more positions within the sales organization. Sometimes they're positions that you haven't enabled in any way, even if, you know, it was marketing just randomly doing enablement. So the size of the organization definitely comes into play. It's smaller than you think when you need it. By the time you think you need it, it's probably too late. <laughs> well, or at least you're behind the eight yeah. ball. But the industries in itself is a very good point because in traditional manufacturing, we see it um, play out in different ways. Um, we also see in high tech, um, high growth, that they have been the driver and kind of the propulsion behind enablement because of the needs of the deep, the needs for deep knowledge in certain areas and the ability for those organizations to fund it because many of them have been high growth and do have the resources to back it. And we see it primarily lowest in, in traditional manufacturing or at least being played out in a different way and highest and more robust in the IT sector, but just about everybody these days has some sort of enablement going on um, within their organizations if they're 25 reps and above across most industries. And is that is that a change? For how rapidly did it did that change happen to where you started seeing that? That's an interesting question. So 
you will see out on LinkedIn and other places stats that are constantly being bombarded, especially in the sales environment, and there a lot of it is propagated by vendors because they're using the sound bite to say, hey, look at this. Um, and what you'll hear is, you know, you'll even see data out there that says, you know, 50% and it's up, you know, 300% since how many people have enablement. It's a hard thing to measure because if you think about it, people collecting stats on sales enablement have a sales enablement study that they're doing. And if they're asking somebody who's filling out a sales enablement study, if you have sales enablement, probably the answer is going to be yes. So it's kind of funny to me that they have this whole survey, but then they say only 60% have sales enablement. So they answered the questions anyway. So the determination of exactly how many is a little bit of a tricky thing. Um, we look at it a little bit differently, and we don't do blind surveys over it. And we look at it not only on an experiential level, but we look at it as what the data is telling us. And we look outside of the enablement function and look at our other areas that cover a lot of other different industries and functions and say, do you have it as well? So combined, we're seeing that enablement enablement efforts are everywhere. Whether or not there's a full-time dedicated centralized person is a whole nother story. What we're starting to see is a rapid transition to saying, I need to make somebody accountable so that I can scale this. The perspective around the data. What are we seeing that's trending? What are we seeing where investments are going? What are we seeing that's on the minds of the C-suite? What's keeping them up at night? Um, and really, for the partner and partner enablement, it looks at the percentage of business through channel, the ecosystem, the segments, the segmentation strategy that channel sales is coming up with to determine what are our prioritized partners and how are we going to manage and enable them to be most effective. So there's a lot of parameters that uh, we look at, but I would agree, and high tech, Early adopters, we're seeing you know a significant amount of investment. And we're really seeing those best practices and high performers, and it's permeating, of course, throughout B two B and B two C. Because we quoted the World Trade Organization saying that seventy five percent of commerce flows through indirect partners. So that's a significant amount of investment that needs to be focused on enabling partners. Yeah, and the interesting thing about channel and partner is over the last two years or so, if you listen to um, investors' calls with the street, if they have a bad quarter, a lot of the words that you're hearing is, we're going to leverage the channel, we're going to become we're going to partner relationships. Wait, are going leverage, to be not blame, right? Yeah, not blame, not yet, that's got next. It, Blaming it. is next. Yeah. <laughs> so that kind of buzz and those, you know, this is our new strategy or we're going to focus on this piece of it makes partners a huge piece of some of these industries yeah. that may be in decline and are saying, how can we offset some of these internal costs? We're moving things to the channel, but that doesn't mean you can't, you have to still enable the channel, and it's not the channel, it's the roles within the channel. Yeah. Not the just a service technician, not just a solutions engineer, um, not just sales, but it's the marketing on down. And I'm talking channel, and she's a channel expert. I know, I love it. <laughs> See what I've done, I've enabled her. Wow. My job here is done. Well, congratulations. <laughs> so, if folks want to get a hold of what you guys have been doing, this research, mm -hmm. what's the way they activate around this? How can they, they dive more in depth if they didn't see your presentation, they've been sure. listening to this fascinating interview, yeah. they're like, oh man, we gotta, we, we gotta get our hands on that. So first of all, you can link in with myself, Heather Cole, Maria Chen, um, on C -H -I -E -N, LinkedIn anytime. C-H-I-E-N, by the way. I-E-N. As in French dog. Yes. 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 <laughs> and Heather she Cole, C-O-L-E. And we can, you can certainly link in with us, but you can also go to the seriousdecisions.com website um, and engage that way for sure as well if you want a kind of a broader sense of the research yes. that we're doing and what's out there. Yes, S-I-R-I-U-S, by the way, yes. decisions. Yes, thank you. Decisions. Very so. good spelling today. Very good. Yeah, yeah, I've got yeah. Feel, I'm feeling kind of right. on top of this. I love it, All right, yeah. this is good. All right, this is Heather Cole. This is Maria Chin, C-H-I-E-N. I'm Rush <laughs> Olson. We're at the coverage desk. We will have more updates with fascinating speakers coming up throughout the day. Thank you for being with us, and keep keeping up with the uh, Sales Enablement Conference. Thank you. Thank you.